Welcome to another edition of this series of talks organized on behalf of SPIDERS, the sole platform for initiating discourses on equitable and resilient society. The talks complement a series of original papers published on the SPIDERS platform dedicated to outlining the building blocks of post-capitalist political economies and societies, not oriented around growth and profit, but rather good lives and a flourishing web of life in times of profound planetary change. Hosting these talks, our founder of the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation, Michelle Bowens, and myself, Rok Kranz. And today, to help us outline some of these building blocks, we're joined by a distinguished guest, Dr. Pavlina Cherna, author of the paper, the Job Guarantee, Structural Change in Economic Democracy, an otherwise renowned author on the subject of the Job Guarantee. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. So to begin with, uh, we thought it would be great for our audiences to hear from you yourself, uh, how you, you would describe your background and research. So essentially what got you into the topic and, and things that have happened since. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, my name is Pavlina Cherneva and I am an associate professor at College in New York, also a research scholar at the, the Levy Economics Institute, as well as uh, director of the newly formed Economic Democracy Initiative at the Open Society University Networks. Yes, my uh, work um, is primarily focused on macroeconomic stability and um, uh, looking at labor markets in particular and um, how macroeconomic stability translates into sort of shared prosperity. I, um, in my formal uh, formative experience, I've been influenced by the work of John Maynard Keynes, Hyman Minsky, uh, and Carl Polanyi. Uh, and particularly the well-known uh, contribution of Polyani that um, markets were created historically, uh, were created and that process had produced a fair amount of social dislocation. And that in fact, the protective response of the public sector was spontaneous. That that was a very natural response and outgrowth of the market mechanism. So we are engaged in this ongoing dialogue of what does it mean to have protective responses? What does it mean to have an economy um, that provides some very basic economic security? I work in the tradition that is now known as modern monetary theory um, that uh, concentrates on a couple of fundamental premises, uh, one of which is that uh, the government is a key uh, player, a key um, um, structural force behind the monetary system. And that indeed uh, the public sector has spending capacities that are not available to other um, agents, agents in the economy. So um, my work uh, is informed by how do we employ the public purse for the public purpose. And so the job guarantee is one policy proposal that emerges out of that work. Uh, so with, uh, uh, with that out of the way, uh, we thought uh, it would be great um, if uh, we take some time uh, for you to describe some basic tenets of your paper. Uh, so as a kind of overview of the job guarantee, uh, policy, as well as uh, some contextualization with with the current Green New Deal talks uh, throughout the world, as well as the ongoing COVID crisis. So uh, we'd give the floor to you. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Maybe um, I can provide a historical context uh, to the paper. Um, for over a hundred years now, the world has been engaged in this conversation of what does it mean to guarantee the right to employment? It is, I believe the first mention of the right to paid employment can be found in the 
French constitution of 1793. And then that conversation has waned and kind of reappeared um, during the um, industrial era, but really it became a very acute uh, call, acute demand uh, around the Great Depression. And it was then internationally recognized in multiple documents, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, including multiple treaties and ILO documents. And we have been engaging in this recurring demand. And the question here before us is how do we connect human rights with economic policy? And the right to employment um, was always recognized as one of two strategies to provide economic security for all. Uh, the two components as the modern architects of the welfare state had it were providing employment to those who need it directly and unconditionally. And the second leg was providing economic security um, to those who cannot work or for other dimensions of economic insecurity. Uh, for example, retirement insecurity, the right to education, the right to health care, um, uh, various other support, child support, etc. So we have been thinking about how to provide the so-called social wage, if you will, but the direct employment solution has been missing as a comprehensive policy strategy, although throughout time, there have been small and large programs that have attempted um, to secure employment to the unemployed and have been inspired by this commitment that in the modern world, in a market economy, the right to employment is a very basic um, uh, human right and the access to a standard of life and well-being um, very much depends on having accessible, well-paid work, not exclusively, but it is a critical element. So how do we then connect macroeconomic policy to then moving forward and achieving um, this, this goal? And in my paper, I argue that there are some obstacles we need to overcome with respect to economic thinking, conventional economic thinking, that the manner in which we tend to stabilize economies uh, during their perennial recessions, crises, downturns, doesn't bring well-being. In fact, it has exacerbated inequality. It has uh, exacerbated the weakening of the labor market protections. Um, it has increased the so-called gigification of work or the precariat. And growth no longer delivers enough jobs and well-paid jobs. And in fact, we can go even a step further. Growth in the private mechanisms simply don't produce adequate and enough employment opportunities, even in the best of times. We don't need recessions to recognize that unemployment is with us, even in the best of times. So why is that the case? And I think that it's fair to say that economic theory simply ignores the problem or does not um, or considers it to be um, natural, the problem of unemployment, natural, perennial, and in some aspects even necessary. So part of the um, paper reviews what is the conventional approach to the natural rate of unemployment. People who are familiar with, uh, with uh, US history, for example, know that the Employment Act of 1945 had the right to paid work um, as explicit language in that act, where the government was charged with providing an employment to those who cannot find it in the private sector. But uh, the, uh, the act of 1946 eliminated that language, the right to work, and then put the burden on private industry through government stimulus to produce growth and then generate maximum employment and price stability. So for, you know, for the first time in, in the policy language, now we have a dual objective full employment and price stability, 
uh, maximum rather, not full, maximum employment and price stability. And then maximum employment um, is then being redefined as some positive level of unemployment. The idea is that there may be a floor to unemployment below which if the economy attempts to move, we might observe inflationary pressures. This economists have formalized then as the uh, Phillips curve relationship and now the so-called NIRU, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Now, these economic concepts are very important um, and um, they represent a policy guide for modern policy. So as an example, you know, macroeconomic models by the Federal Reserve um, and other, you know, major uh, institutions have a NIRU embedded in them, meaning that um, to be able to generate macroeconomic stability, we need to hit that target, the NIRU target. And if for some reason the labor market is generating more jobs than whatever the natural rate is or the NIRU rate is, then we might see undesirable wage pressures that may translate into undesirable inflation. And so our attention has completely you know, moved away from securing jobs for those who need them to this um, narrow um, objective of securing price stability through unemployment. And that's the basic premise that I, ch that I challenge, that indeed there are policy options out there that um, can secure full employment and price stability all together at the same time, that there is not a necessary trade-off between the two and that indeed we don't have to tolerate mass unemployment in the name of price stability. That, to me, is a uh, is a economically is a is an economic um, argument that is morally bankrupt. But also, it's not founded on economic principles because there are other ways of tackling both problems. Okay, so the job guarantee is one such method. Um, simply directly empl employ the unemployed, do it in an anti-cyclical ma manner, uh, put in place a macroeconomic automatic stabilizer that will be employment stabilizer that will behave very much like unemployment, expanding the employment program will be expanding in downturns, will be shrinking in expansions, thus providing the macroeconomic stabilizer that unemployment provides today. Of course, it is superior on multiple levels because unemployment brings unconscionable toll on communities, on people, social costs that ripple through the economy that are very difficult um, to reverse, and uh, they create uh, simply vicious cycles. Whereas the direct employment solution is paying for um, protecting our most valuable resource, people, uh, while providing meaningful public service employment in areas that are also neglected in the public sphere. And so we have, and again, a two-pronged strategy that um, provides a virtuous cycle. In other words, the public sector will always respond with some sort of stabilization. And we either pay to, main, to have unemployment and we pay for all the associated um, costs of unemployment, or we can simply go to the direct solution and pay for employment um, and provide work into meaningful public sector um, opportunities. Now I connect the, the job guarantee proposal to modern calls to democratize work. Um, and um, I talk about the added benefit of securing full employment um, that will strengthen global solidarity. And the basic argument here is that it is very difficult to democratize work in the workplace when the threat of unemployment is looming over workers that so long as the labor market behaves as this game of musical chairs, there will always be that hidden um, threat that uh, workers will have to take into consideration as they negotiate their work in their workplaces. And it is very easy to give up some hard fought 
uh, victories like benefits and working hours and working conditions because the far worse situation and evil is actually losing that job. Okay. And so unemployment has this is a structural force that structures who gets the scarce jobs that are out there in the private economy. And we'd like to eliminate that, uh, that force because then it empowers people in the workplace as well. Um, they don't have to tolerate a wage theft. They don't have to tolerate harassment. Um, they can extract better working and pay conditions um, if there is an overall uh, better employment security um, throughout the economy. Why I say that it also strengthens solidarity is because a public option for jobs like the job guarantee will then represent the very basic standard for employment in the entire economy. Whatever the pay is in the public option will become the benchmark for pay in private industry. And um, securing a job guarantee at a living wage with some very basic benefits, that becomes the minimum necessary living uh, working standard which then helps formalize other employment opportunities in the private sector and thus provides um, a kind of new social contract for working families. So just to sum up this discussion up to this point, I think the question before us is the following. As we move forward with rethinking the role of the public sector, uh, rethinking um, the future of work. What kind of policy do we need to put in place? Is the old social contract enough? Raising the minimum wage, maybe strengthening unions, providing better unemployment insurance, the traditional methods, is that enough? And I would argue that it was not enough, even in the immediate post-war era. Yes, um, that was kind of the golden age for many Western economies in terms of um, growth, stability, macroeconomic stability, but it wasn't shared equally by all. There were still many people who were left behind. There was still poverty. There was still unemployment. And so as we move forward, of course, we want to strengthen these components of the welfare safety net, but we need to also put in the second missing, missing leg of that strategy, and that is the direct employment strategy. Um, the way we do it is going to be very important. So it is not just enough to guarantee the right to employment, but to make sure that it is the right. It's not the obligation to employment, that it is not a forced requirement for work in exchange for, for benefits that uh, people receive. But in fact, it is a democratically instituted voluntary employment program for those who choose to avail themselves. Um, and so um, a democratically run job guarantee is the way to go forward um, by getting in you know, input from the community, enhancing participatory democracy. And there are many examples like this around the world of programs that are organized around the goal of guaranteeing uh, the right to employment, but also with the input of the unemployed themselves, with the input of the communities where the public service jobs are created. And so I discussed some such um, examples. Um, for example, the Rural Employment Guarantee Act in India, as well as smaller programs in the Western world, such as the long-term unemployment zones in, in France. There are many other uh, projects and programs that you could argue are forerunners um, to the job guarantee. I Before maybe I discuss some of those um, experiences, I just want to articulate that in the current conversation, the right to employment once again has been singled out as a critical component of, of several um, important uh, initiatives and uh, statements, international statements. The first one is um, the recent call to democratize work um, that was, uh, that reverberated across the globe earlier in 2020 um, and was published in 46 uh, newspapers in 26 languages around the world that called for three things. 
One is to democratize work in the workplace, uh, two, to guarantee the right to employment, and three, to remediate the environment. And the second important uh, international conversation that has embraced the job guarantee is that of uh, addressing the climate crisis. Um, the Green New Deal resolution in the United States has made it a, a, key, a, a key component. And it also recognizes the Paris Accord statement that in fact a tr just transition rests on securing a just transition for workers um, into uh, the green economy. And so the job guarantee from the early days of the Roosevelt era has always been green, always had very strong conservation component, the kinds of projects that were done um, uh, that dealt with, uh, with environmental conservation uh, were incredibly successful and popular. But today, jobs programs continue to embrace that model, again, because the environment is neglected. The private sector is unable to address rapidly um, and in adequate, at, at an adequate scale the climate uh, challenges before us, and we need the public sector to lead, putting the unemployed to work uh, in remediation is one effective way of tackling these the dual challenge of securing the right to employment and uh, uh, tackling the climate challenges before us. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paulina, for this overview. Uh, so at this point, we would uh, jump over to some questions and uh, answers or a kind of discussion more format. Uh, I don't know if, Michelle, you had a question you wanted to start with, or shall I? I have one question, which uh, I'm sure you heard before, but uh, it's kind of important for me because I belong to the same category. Uh, so, you know, when you talk about the gig economy, there's a lot of false uh, gig work, but it is also a growing sector of people that just work like that. So. Uh, I'm part of a labor mutual called SMART, which is um, about 30,000 members in Europe, smart.coop. And 80% of our members are, you know, this is something that they've chosen to do. So they're artists, software developers, all kinds of people, and they really work on a project basis. Um, and so we call ourselves autonomous workers because at the same time we you know, we work in the market, but we kind of chose, choose our clients. And that's kind of a freedom that we appreciate that we have, you know, our kind of um, strategic ways of thinking about, about our work. Anyway, so this is my question. So for people like this, the notion of a guaranteed job doesn't really hold much appeal because they're not looking for a job. And of course, that's not a critique of what you're proposing, which is very relevant for the large majority of workers that, that need and want this. I was just wondering if you had also thought about this other group of work workers and what kind of, what kind of extra measures would work for you know, this kind of freelance uh, sector that is not necessarily looking for permanent employment, but it has kind of this ongoing engagements in a, you know, in a portfolio of work. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. The job guarantee is a vo voluntary a program that uh, you may or may not take. And with respect to the, the gig economy, I think that the relationship there is that we can finally sort out which of these relationships are actually genuinely voluntary, like the one that you are mentioning, versus those that are um, coerced under the absence of other alternative. And so when we talk about, for example, you know, Uber drivers, uh, folks that might not be able to secure other more stable work, it looks like that's a voluntary choice, but it is done under duress. And so what the job guarantee attempts to do is just change the macroeconomic picture and conditions. It certainly is not saying everybody has to be in a stable, full-time, permanent contract, uh, you know, formal employment relationship. Um, but what it would do is create an environment um, that is not subject to these 
fluctuations, economic fluctuations, especially employment fluctuations that then undermine the contracts of the freelancers, the other profit opportunities for small mom and pop shops, um, and just overall employment opportunities. So um, we have seen that you know countries that have taken the, the goal of securing tight full employment and very low unemployment rate seriously, see stable labor markets. Um, I would point to the example of Japan in the post-war era, the corporatist model in the Nordic countries. We just don't see these amplitudes of unemployment that, you know, yo-yo effect, you know, shooting up in recessions and slowly recovering in expansions. And so the macroeconomic environment changes. Um, we have modeled the job guarantee with colleagues at the Levy Economics Institute, and we find that private sector employment is permanently increased as a consequence of uh, implementing a job guarantee, which would mean, you know, better employment opportunities for others. And, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the job guarantee also provides uh, uh, options because, you know, you might not be able to work eight hours in the job guarantee if you are looking for work. You might be a caregiver. And maybe you do want paid work, but four hours in the community might be enough. And so I think that that's really the conversation where we want to, uh, you know, engage in. You know, what kind of work do we want? Uh, do we want everybody to be toiling away um, because they cannot secure, you know, a basic living income, or can we provide various options in which people can be successful? Um, Rock, I have another question. Maybe I'll finish that one and then you can take over for me in the questions. Um, again, this is a, I'm sure you have heard it many times, uh, which is the big discussion between basic income and job guarantee. Um, and some of the people would argue that the kind of basic income is a kind of post work solution. So, you know, for people who want to do transitioning, um, become neo rurals, you know, engage in organic food, or so a lot of sectors that the market is not taken care of, and who think they would benefit if they would have a stable income that would not be linked to work, because they are, they actually already know what they want to do, and so they these kind of people tend to be in favor of a basic income, and then would would argue that the job guarantee is kind of like you know, keeping people within the traditional employment uh, system, which doesn't do those things yet. And so holding back a transition that could go a lot faster if there were a basic income. I just want to, to see how you, how you reason about this. Yeah, I mean, there's the very practical aspect of, and then there's the philosophical aspect. Um, the practical aspect is the following. A lot of people want work. And even the basic income experiments show that people want paid work and they have trouble finding it. So that's number one. And number two is that we actually have a lot of work that needs to be done. It's like we haven't, the, the planet is not a complete proposition. We haven't finished the job of, you know, taking care of the environment, of maintaining our environment, nurturing, being good stewards. There's just countless of neglected social needs. And I think that that is really, you know, connects to the philosophical question of the human condition. You know, does it, you know, will providing income um, to people simply give them the good life? And I would say that no, it will not because the market simply doesn't provide the good life already to people who have income, right? Uh, you know, I use often the example of how expensive childcare might be or housing and I have income and others have income and still um, there is, um, the access to public services, um, as we notice, around the world um, has been, you know, is inadequate, simply inadequate, you know, and, and uh, in many areas, we talk about food deserts in the United States, rich country that has countless of communities that don't have access to good, decent quality food. We talk about health deserts, not just in the US, we talk about health deserts in, in Western developed countries as well. Of course, these problems are much more acute in the global south, right? And so there is so much work to do to rebalance the scales, you know, to borrow from 
John Kenneth Galbraith, the social balance theory that, uh, you know, the public sector needs to, um, um, you know, to be supported um, and, you know, to have the right kinds of investment. So what will, what will basic income do for that? I think very, very little without the structural investments that need to be undertaken and those take work and those take, somebody will have to do the work. So the philosophical question then is, why should some folks be exempt from that work while others have to do the work? And this is a trickier question because we don't, we don't, we're not saying that we want to perpetuate the, the work society, the work world. We want to transform the way it is done. And I think that the way our conversations um, come together is through the idea of participation income, because a lot of folks on the UBI side say, well, I would like to be here in the community working in my community garden. And I say, well, the job guarantee is attempting to fill the food desert problem. We are going to build community gardens um, to address that social need. So it's really um, a, a conversation that we can have together about how we transform work. Also, um, you know, the job guarantee has other democratizing, you know, uh, uh, a big democratizing potential in the sense that it doesn't really create employment for profit, right, or exclusively for, for profit. It creates employment for public need, for public ser service, um, for social goals. And then the terms on which you become employed change, right? You're not no longer under threat because you haven't fulfilled a particular quota. Now, the way we value your input to work is based on these other social considerations. And I think that is also um, you know, democratizing um, in terms of how people self-organize the kind of work that they do. Um, as I said in, uh, in my introduction, it's very interesting to see how people organize these programs from the ground up how they participate in the process of evaluating their communities and what their communities need, and then create the projects in which they themselves can participate. I think the India Rural Employment Guarantee is, is, is truly um, extraordinary uh, to study, even though it is not funded adequately. And despite all the obstacles, it serves 30% of households um, in, uh, uh, in a, an economy that uh, you know, has a lot of rural poverty, but it, it, it counts on the rural councils and the, the public forums to create the jobs uh, with input um, uh, uh, of community members. And the program has become the leading program um, for water conservation efforts in the nation, as well as uh, emission reduction. So it is quite possible to create large scale employment programs that do meaningful social work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that was kind of uh, a question that I had, but I think uh, we kind of covered it quite a bit. Um, in other words, um, it would have been like, yeah, giving people the ability to co-define uh, work or redefine work, also including, say, reproductive labor and, and what's currently regarded as volunteer work, etc., regenerative activities and so forth. And I really liked uh, your emphasis on this participatory bottom-up approach, also in connection to to yeah innovating new social and ecological services uh, both in local communities and and translocal or or networked in, into larger structures. Um, so and just maybe to just to emphasize that it's not the exclusive solution. It's part of the two leg strategy, right? It's yeah. it's the job solution, but of course there will be an income solution because we know uh, many people cannot work, should not work. You know, students need to go to school and have affordable education. Caregivers uh, are already doing work that is unpaid. Um, they need to be supported. And so there are, there are ways in which these programs can coexist very successfully uh, together. Mm. Otherwise I have maybe a more political question. Um, since we have a new government uh, in the US, 
um, are there any indications that that like progress might be on the horizon that that this idea is actually making progress and getting more legitimacy and and maybe even some concrete plans uh, you know eventually an example an example from outside the us is fine too but kind of a, if you can give us a sense of you know what's the state of play around these these proposals yes the job guarantee um entered the political discourse i think in the mainstream political discourse maybe two or three years ago 2018 there was a lot of interest in in the media and a number of presidential candidates at the time had endorsed the idea you know so so you are hearing a lot about the job guarantee out there. Now, interestingly, there were some new polls that were done in the United States, also in the UK, and those were showing overwhelming bipartisan support, you know, upwards of 70% uh, nationally. I mean, that is, that's quite significant. And also majority support even in deep red states, you know, conservative states, I would say, and also various uh, polls that have uh, polled conservative voters also show um, support for this program. So it is it is um, popular. There are a number of uh, people who are working on job guarantee bills uh, right now in Congress. Some are already out there. Some are in the works. So uh, we will see exactly where that goes with the current administration. While President Biden himself has not to my knowledge, uttered the words job guarantee. Um, he has, his environmental agenda became bolder throughout the presidential uh, campaign. And he has just put out a framework for that environmental agenda, which has a civilian climate core. That is to deal with environmental renewal and um, uh, restore public lands and <clears throat> deal with some of the um, some of the environmental impact there. I think the question here is: this is a, a wonderful opening and really uh, a way to go forward with a bold jobs program, a la New Deal. The question is: what will be the scale, and how will that be organized? I think that you know, to me, there are you know three fundamental principles to go forward. I, I would like to see in law the legally enforced right, that it is, it is embedded again in the language in those document, documents. Um, the second would be that this will be uh, publicly funded, uh, which likely it will be, but also that these are public jobs or public sector or nonprofit jobs. Um, rather than attempt to work through the traditional channels of incentivizing only private sector um, uh, companies to do the work. Um, it's, you know, this is public service and we should have the institutional capacity once again to address those public needs. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, maybe I have a question. Um, so within the kind of spiders project, uh, one of the kind of more salient uh, upcoming discourses uh, that were identified and, and several papers uh, are oriented around is, of course, the post growth or degrowth debate. Um, and I was wondering uh, if you kind of have any opinions or, or placements of, of uh, your kind of takes on, on the job guarantee within the kind of status quo growth versus green growth versus degrowth slash post growth uh, debates. Yeah, thank you for that question. I um, am perennially dissatisfied with uh, current conversations about let's let's boost growth, let's run the economy hot. I mean, that is really the modern, uh, like the new conversation, you know, you know, the, the labor market was sluggish for such a long time. Growth has been anemic. Um, it's just, we need bigger, bolder government action. Now that, the first, that bigger, bolder government action, I agree with. But what does it mean to run the economy hot? Like, what does that mean exactly? What we know from the data, some of which I discuss in the, uh, in the paper, is that growth 
delivers inequality. And that has been the case for the last 50 years. So whose incomes are growing? Um, what kind of activities are we stimulating? We, we know that growth is also extractive, environmentally damaging. It also feeds into financial crises if growth leads to a runaway speculative investment and housing. I mean, what are we talking about exactly? And so here the content of the big bold government action to me needs to take precedent. That, that the how has to be the more important conversation. Um, not the how large the size, because you could conceivably imagine that we appropriate a very large budget, which, which we just did, um, that doesn't make a significant impact on labor markets, and perhaps it generates a fair amount of profits for some firms, um, maybe, you know, boost growth, although the pandemic really um, uh, puts you know, the big break on growth right now. And so you can conceivably imagine very large uh, package that has relatively small economic effect, right? And what would that, that, what would that do to the modern revival of the public purpose? I think it could be quite damaging, right? If we don't deliver what we are promising and we go with big package, um, then the Austerians are going to return and they're going to say, look, you know, we, we spent so much money, it didn't create what we needed. So, so for me, the focus on public investment and public employment from the bottom up is the way to go rather than just push growth at all costs, that we do growth from the bottom and also growth in an environmentally sustainable way. So the job guarantee and the Conservation Climate Core and the Green New Deal are just a win-win strategy, right? You create housing where housing is needed. You clean up the polluted environment. You um, support sustainable agriculture. Um, you do uh, coastal remediation and we deal with fires and floods. Um, at the same time, it's not going to be the perfect solution because it is still an unequal economy, highly concentrated economy. Um, and you know, you will have to do something about those extractive industries as well. But um, in terms of growth, I would prefer from the bottom up rather than conventional pro-investment, you know, subsidies, tax cuts, that sort of thing, policies. With regards to the degrowth, you know, conversation, I mean, you know, we have an environmental envelope and that has to guide policy. You know, clearly there are some environmental limits um, and that will inform the kind of investments that we're going to make. Um, I think that certainly lifestyle adjustments are, uh, are going to be part and parcel of that strategy if we are serious about um, uh, pro you know, protecting the environment. The question is, do we need to have, do we need to have like no growth? And here, my answer is, it depends what we measure in that growth number really depends how it's measured. Um, we can create, for example, many more after school activities and pay people to run those after school activities. Those are, they will feed, they will add up to GDP. Right? They will produce some service, but the service in and of itself doesn't pillage the environment. And so I think that um, the chasing the growth number is not in and of itself a macroeconomic objective. The number doesn't tell you anything, but what's measured, you can still produce growth, but it could be sustainable growth. I, I have a, actually it's a heavy question, but I might not have time to answer it fully. But the way I understand your paper, you're linking three things. Your the job guarantees linked to the Green New Deal which kind of informs what kind of jobs need to be created. And that is linked to the modern monetary because you need to fund all of that, right? Uh, so how strong is that last connection? What, what if we take out modern monetary, modern monetary theory? Um, how, how do you, do you fund the federal guarantee if you wouldn't have that, if, if maybe, you know, some some framework in the in the government says no no we don't want to do that so how how would you then react to that constraint my um 
my preference would be that our debate is informed by modern monetary theory and for the following reasons. The public sector has uh, the responsibility for stabilizing an economy. We know that uh, whether we recognize it or we don't recognize it, um, it's always the case that the fallout from poverty, unemployment, climate devastation falls on the public sector. And so we have been for you know, 50 years pretending that the government sector doesn't have the money, which has meant that we have exacerbated these problems. But it's still the case that the government pays for a sick person that shows up in the hospital, for a homeless person that is on the street, for a child that doesn't have employed parents and is hungry and goes to school. That is still happening. So one way to answer this question is that the, the costs are already there. They are unavoidable and unescapable. We, we are committing resources. Um, and we can just do things better by doing the job guarantee. So one does not need to acknowledge MMT to uh, recognize that we can simply pay for employment rather than neglect and poverty, okay? However, the MMT um, component becomes, I think, crucial because you don't have all the ammunition to defend these policies. You know, you could see the pendulum swinging in, you know, 20 more years and somebody saying, okay, well, it's really, the government really doesn't have these resources. I mean, it's all well and good to provide employment for people. It's very nice, but, you know, we just don't have the, the public funding capacity. We're robbing our future generations. That conversation needs to be put to rest once and for all. And the only way you do it is by understanding government finances. Now, it is true that some countries don't have the policy space that MMT highlights when we look at sovereign uh, monetary regimes. Some countries um, voluntarily impose limits on their spending and their budgets. Other countries completely abdicate their sovereignty, right? We have uh, dollarized countries, we have currency boards, we have the Eurozone. So unless we have uh, I think an appreciation of what sovereign currency permits, we can be going down this path of these highly restrictive monetary regimes and just not play with all of the tools that we have at hand. So, you know, I think that, I think it's very important to connect the two, but if you live in the Eurozone and uh, it is socially important to move towards full employment, that goal should still be pursued whether sovereignty is there or not. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we're kind of nearing a full hour, uh, but I think uh, it would be great um, to hear from you, Paulina. Uh, like we heard a little bit about the kind of necessary key steps or, or leverages that you see, including legis legislative change and so on. Uh, but for listeners, uh, maybe it would be great uh, to hear from you some perhaps uh, resource recommendations uh, to kind of, um, yeah, broaden or expand horizons on the subject and also perhaps some uh, very active advocacy groups or, you know, in short, uh, how can one support uh, and further this discussion and, and contribute? Yes, I'd, I'd like to highlight the work of um, a job guarantee advocacy group. Um, listeners can go to jobguaranteenow.org, which has a manifest, a manifesto, a, a, a pledge to work towards a job guarantee that has been signed by many, not just academics, but uh, all uh, or civil um, groups, uh, civics groups, uh, unions, individuals, various other. Um, um, uh, organizations who have also made it part of their policy agenda. There are some local and regional groups who are organizing their work around a, a job guarantee. So that would be one important resource page also for legislative efforts that are forthcoming. Now I will also direct people to democrat democratizingwork.org uh, where the work um, has been taken at the international level and also intersects with other initiatives for participatory democracy and for democratizing um, the workplace um, more broadly uh, speaking. And um, of course, you know, the, 
national, the international organizations who are reviving that conversation. The UN recently had a conference on global leadership, but the ILO produced a report in 2019, um, as I mentioned, on the future of work that centered around or put the job guarantee as one of the core components of uh, rethinking um, the new social contract. So there are, I think, many ways in which one can get involved. And I am cautiously optimistic that that conversation is is becoming um, international as well. And thank you for highlighting it as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll be sure yeah. also to include those links uh, in like next to the- Yeah, it was, it was yeah. a great conversation, very lively, very well explained. I think it's one of the best ones so far. Great. Um, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. very good. No, thank you very much for the, yeah, for the questions. Uh, I, I enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing it.